It began sometime at night on June 29, 2005. Someone called 911 after seeing a horse lying on the ground outside. The horse was adjacent to the house the person was renting. When police arrived, the horse was lying on the ground in a pool of her blood. The horse was named Sarah Moon and she was struck five times in the lungs. Later, around 3.30 in the morning, just two miles northeast from where the horse was killed, a man, David Estrada, was standing on the sidewalk on 83rd Avenue near Jack in the Box when a customer was pulling out of the drive-thru. The driver didn't notice anything until his headlights revealed a man laying flat on the sidewalk. They believed it may have been a drunk person who simply had too much to drink and passed out. The driver called the police just to be sure. As police arrived, they learned that not only was this man David, but this was clearly a homicide. He was shot in his lung, penetrating an inch away from his spine. David was only 20 years old. He was waiting to be picked up by a friend for a road trip to California. He was carrying his guitar and duffel bag, all of which were present at the crime scene. This meant that robbery couldn't have been a motive. Weeks go by and detectives were still trying to figure out who could have killed David. With such small clues and no witnesses, it was hard to find a lead to solve the case. And then it happened again, July 20th, 2005. Police received a 911 call late in the night at Tolson Farms that their horse was shot. Luckily, this horse, Apache, survived. Later, two miles heading north on 87th Avenue, police received another call that their dog, Whiskey, was shot. Whiskey didn't survive. At this point, detectives suspected that they had a serial shooter on their hands. The serial shooter would strike again just five days later. On July 25th, 2005, police received a call from someone reporting that their horse, Little Man, was shot and killed. This happened on North 107th Avenue, three miles from where Whiskey died. So far, there have been five shootings. All but one were animals, and only one of the animals survived. There was no telling when the shooter would strike again, and people in Arizona began feeling scared as police were telling the public to remain indoors at night. From what police have gathered, the shootings have taken place anytime between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. Again, all shootings had no witnesses or clues to any potential leads. The streets of Phoenix would be quiet for the next four months with no reports of random shootings. November 11, 2005 Shortly before 10 p.m., two dogs were shot. The first dog died while the second was wounded. The first dog, Shep, was killed here on North 61st Drive. The second dog, Irving, was just shot a few blocks away on 65th Drive. They were both shot within minutes of each other. About an hour goes by and a stray dog was shot here on East Monroe Street. Fortunately, the stray dog left without a scratch. The unfortunate part, it was because someone died protecting it. Police arrived at the scene after reports of a shooting and found a man dead at the scene. The victim was 46-year-old Nathaniel Schaffner. He was homeless and died protecting the stray dog after noticing someone attempting to shoot it. For the rest of the month, the violence would once again die down until late December, and the violence only got worse. December 29, 2005 The bartending school on South 51st Street in Tempe was shot up around 7pm. Luckily, nobody was around so no one was injured. Three hours later at 10.10 p.m., a woman was walking with her dog at Los Olivos Park when suddenly a vehicle pulls up by her and began firing at her dog. The woman was unharmed, but her dog Cherokee didn't survive. 20 minutes later, seven miles south of the last shooting, Jose Ortiz was gunned down on North 10th Avenue. The next block over, Marco Corillo was shot and killed. The shooter took off but came back to the area around 11.39 p.m. There, the perpetrator shot Timmy Tordai. Timothy first thought he had a heart attack until he noticed blood was dripping from his neck. Thankfully, Timmy managed to walk a few steps to his home where he called 911 and got treated for his wounds. But the rampage wasn't over yet. Around midnight, seven miles north of the last victim, two dogs, 
Peyton, and Martin were both shot and killed on East Granada Road. Less than a mile away on 34th Street, another dog named Peanut was shot and killed. Two hours later at 2.15am, Clarissa Rowley was shot, but luckily survived. Unfortunately, while at the hospital, she found out she was pregnant and the shooting resulted in a miscarriage. In just seven hours, there were eight shootings, leaving six dead and two injured. Detective Cliff Jewell and the rest of his team were at the crime scene where Marco, Jose, and Timmy were shot. When looking at Marco's body, detectives realized he was shot twice in the chest. It was believed that the shooter may have interacted with Marco, luring him to their direction before opening fire. And just a block over, they began looking at Jose's body. They discovered that he was shot in the chest as well. Detectives began driving around hoping to find any leads. This is when Detective Jewel started to pull surveillance cameras from the state buildings in hopes to find any clues, and fortunately, he catches a break. Here you see a vehicle drive slow at this intersection, and if you look closely, you can see a cat walking on the sidewalk here. And just as the car goes off camera, you can see the cat get scared and run off. Another camera catches the car speeding off. The cat running was a critical clue as they believed that that was the moment the person in the vehicle began firing, causing the cat to jump and run off. Unfortunately, due to the quality of the footage, detectives were not able to identify the vehicle. One thing was certain, this killer had no specific targets. All were of different races, sexes, ages, and animals. All victims were randomly picked for being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Clarissa Rowley got a close look at the shooter right before he fired. She described them as a scruffy white male. It may be a vague description, but this is something they needed. Forensics began analyzing the cartridge casings found at the crime scene. They noticed these casings had the same imprints as the casings found where David was murdered. Citizens in Phoenix stayed indoors, refusing to go out for walks. Residents felt paranoid and unsafe in their community. They began arming themselves with weapons and formed a group called Guardian Angels. A press conference was held by the Phoenix Police Department on January 24, 2006, warning people to be more vigilant and to discourage people from walking anywhere between 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. Months would go by without any random late night shootings. This led people to feel slightly comfortable being out again, thinking that the killer finally decided to stop. However, the shootings came back in May 2006. At 10.05 p.m., a 17-year-old teenager was walking to a convenience store when a vehicle pulled up beside him, shooting him once with a shotgun on North 44th Street. He survived. 15 minutes later, 3 miles east, Claudia Gutierrez was walking home from work when again, a vehicle pulled up beside her, shooting her once with a shotgun. Two weeks later on May 17th, 35-year-old Timothy Davenport was at a parking lot when a man in his vehicle started calling for him. Before he can get close enough, he was stabbed from behind. He was stabbed a few times on his back and his left side. May 30th, 2006. At around 11 p.m., 56-year-old James Hodge was shot and wounded. When police arrived at the crime scene, they began talking to potential witnesses. They talked to two men who live at the apartment complex where the crime took place. The two men were 33-year-old Del Hausner and his friend Samuel Dietman. Both were questioned as to what they may have heard or seen. Their story was that both were looking for Del's missing cat when they suddenly heard a man screaming and saw him injured. Afterward, the men were thanked for their cooperation and were let go. But hours later at around 1.30 a.m., 35-year-old Miguel Rodriguez was walking on West Indian School Road when he noticed a car driving slowly and shot him. He immediately fell to the ground. Less than three miles away on West Camelback Road, 44-year-old Daryl Davies was shot as he was walking through an intersection. Both victims survived the attack.
the Walmart Supercenter on North 95th Avenue had to evacuate 120 people after a mysterious fire started from behind the store at around 10 p.m. Nearly an hour later, another Walmart 20 minutes away from the first one faced the same issue. A mysterious fire started behind the store and 75 people were forced to evacuate. Both stores were badly damaged, totaling $5 million in damages. Investigators believe this could have been the work of a disgruntled former employee. They set up a $10,000 reward for any information that would lead to an arrest. But while investigators were busy dealing with the fires, they would soon have a new problem to face. Minutes after the second fire started, 45-year-old Paul Patrick, a military veteran, was crossing the road at West Indian School Road. He was out walking to buy cigarettes when he noticed a vehicle slowing down near him. He then heard a blast and immediately dropped down, feeling pain. All I can think is, dear Lord, let this be quick. He was there to protect me. He said, sometimes here no one should hurt you. Investigators got a break when they received CCTV footage inside both Walmarts and noticed these two men who were present at both Walmarts around the time the fires had started. They began asking the public for help to identify the two suspects and received an anonymous tip that the man on the left is someone who goes by Sammy. This person said they knew him from a couple of bars on the west side of Phoenix. Investigators began hanging around the area hoping to catch this Sammy person but to no avail. Three days later, on June 11, 2006, 31-year-old Elizabeth Clark was riding her bicycle around 10.30 p.m. on West Camelback Road. A car drives by her and shot her with the shotgun. Luckily, she survived the attack. Nine days pass and more people were shot. 57-year-old Frederick Cena was working at a liquor store located on East Indian School Road. While outside going through his toolbox, he was shot and wounded at 1.59 a.m. 20 minutes later on Van Buren Street, 46-year-old Tony Long was crossing the street when he was shot with the shotgun. Thankfully, he survived. On July 1st at 1.23 a.m., 46-year-old Diane Bean was walking when she was suddenly shot. A security guard nearby witnessed her running and screaming after hearing a loud pop sound. The shooters took off and half an hour later, 24-year-old Jeremy Ortiz was walking in a parking lot on East Oak Street listening to music through his headphones. He was shot and wounded, but he didn't know. He described hearing a loud firecracker and suddenly feeling discomfort. Thankfully, he was fine after being treated at a nearby hospital. The shootings continued for the next few weeks. All were around between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. Some were going on walks, bike rides, or just hanging outside their own home. All were shot and wounded, but fortunately for investigators, they caught another break. A man by the name of Ron Horton reached out to investigators, saying his friend Sammy admitted to the random shootings while the two were intoxicated at a bar. His friend's name was Samuel Dietman, one of the men police had already talked to. It started some time at night when both Ron and Samuel were at the bar, Stardust, when Samuel asked Ron if he knew what it was like to kill somebody. Ron felt uncomfortable with his question but responded saying, What are you talking about? No, I never killed anyone. Samuel responds with, Well, I know what it feels like. From there, he admits to Ron that it was he who has been responsible for the random killings and mentioned details that police knew no one should know besides the killers themselves, such as killing their victims with a 410 shotgun. Ron says that Samuel called it RRVing, which stood for Random Recreational Violence. With investigators now having a prime suspect, they were hoping that Ron could get Samuel to confess again, but this time on audio. Ron was reluctant to help the police. He was afraid of the possible chance of getting an innocent person in legal trouble, as well as being considered a snitch. However, he still called and texted Samuel in hopes he could meet up with him, still thinking there was a chance it was not him. This was around nighttime on July 30th. 
It was unusual that Samuel wasn't picking up his calls or responding to text messages as he normally does. Ron just assumed he was busy and sent them one last text message. It was admittedly a half-hearted attempt. Unfortunately, the same night on July 30th, 22-year-old Robin Blasneck was out walking to her boyfriend's house while talking on her phone around 11 at night. While on the phone, a vehicle pulls up beside her and fires at her once. Neighbors heard the shot and ran out to see Robin on the ground. While the neighbors waited for the ambulance to arrive, they quickly grabbed some rags at their house to stop the bleeding. At the hospital, Robin was pronounced dead at 11.17pm. The neighbors said her last words were, I've been shot. Oddly enough, her death happened around the same time Ron reached out to Samuel. When Ron heard about Robin's death, he felt guilty. So he went back to the police and agreed to help after stating that Robin's death affected him and thought he could have prevented it had he helped the police earlier. Finally, after attempting to reach out to Samuel, he agreed to meet up with Ron the following night at the Stardust Bar. Investigators there noticed that Samuel didn't drive there himself. He was dropped off by his close friend and roommate, Dale Hausner. After Dale drove off, he went to the mall, where police placed a GPS tracker under Dale's vehicle. Later in the night, Dale picks up Samuel from the bar, and detectives noticed the duffel bag Dale was grabbing from the trunk. When he got back inside his car, they were able to see the duffel bag between the two men. The surveillance team began getting worried. Dale and Sam began driving around the East Phoenix area and noticed that they would do U-turns whenever they saw pedestrians walking or drive slower whenever they spotted someone. But as other cars got near them, they began speeding off. This happened a few times and police concluded that this was them hunting down more potential victims. On August 2nd, around 9.30 in the morning, police wiretapped their apartment after obtaining a warrant from a judge. Police began listening to their conversations. Other things that the two have said was calling themselves pioneers. Samuel talked about changing his appearance to look more of a Hispanic male when going out shooting people. Dale mocked Robin a second time, mimicking her last words before she passed away. And discuss who to kill next. Once investigators listen to the recordings, they arrest both Dell and Samuel in their apartments at 11.55 p.m. on August 3rd. They didn't fight back, they both appeared calm and were not surprised about being arrested. Inside, police found weapons. Ammunition a bag of lighters, pipes as both suspects were heavy meth users, and many newspaper articles, clippings, and newscast recordings all relating to their crimes. Outside their apartment in the trash bin was a trash bag that police noticed Sam was taking out earlier. Inside they discovered a map that tracked where the suspects had shot their targets. There was also an empty can that had a shotgun shell inside and was matched to the shells found at Robin's crime scene. In Dale's car, there were many 22 rounds linked to the many random shootings that occurred over the past year. 
Both were interrogated and police thought Samuel would be tough to crack but he admitted everything then and there. But for Dale, it was all a game to him. I stay out of trouble for most of the part, you know, except for alcohol and a couple of little drugs every now and then. I haven't been in trouble with the law or anything, but that would just be so um, a kick in the ass to me, a spit in the face, that someone would use my gun and my, my car to go out and, and hurt people like that. You specifically said, um, quote, what about the guy who shot at 27th Avenue in Northern? I said that was me and not Sam. Positive. Why would you say something like that? I. People say silly stuff when they're drunk, coming with a Mel Gibson. I keep talking to the serial killer, the other guy, he's going around shooting people. Um, what do you know about that particular case? Um, 35 people shot, uh, animals, horses, dogs, um, five, six people dead. I'm just saying, but if he killed however many people he killed or shot or whatever, that's, that's on him, that's not on me, so I'll, I'll not protect anybody, so. Okay. I'm not a genius or anything, but I would, we should talk about it. it just couldn't be this hard. I mean, maybe it is this hard to catch people, but... Maybe the person's just really good. I it mean, could be a right genius, I mean. it could be a law enforcement officer, it could be Green, it could be Sam, it could be anybody. The person's got to be smart, you know, because I mean, they've been getting away with this for a long time. Do you have any idea why you're here? Uh, yeah, I believe it'd be the serial shooter case. Sometimes you just you know, see somebody and turn around and come back and hit him. And then all of a sudden he's, you know, just, uh, lean back for a second. Okay. And was it? Oh. Bang. Okay. And then he continues on the way. And what does Dale do after he fires? Uh, he just kind of chuckles a little bit and... And he has a gun down beside his leg there. He kind of looked at me for a second and kept driving. Is it fair to say that Dale was more interested in, in the notoriety of this than you were? Is that fair to say? Yeah, fair to say. Well, Did you? talked about it quite a bit once I started to stand there. Samuel had given other details that detectives weren't aware of, such as one of Dale's brothers, Jeff Hausner, was in on it. Sam claims that the first few shootings were done by both Jeff and Dale. The stabbing of Timothy was done by Jeff Hausner, as he was there with them that day. Specifically to you, about being responsible for the death of another human being. Well, Jeff has, but that's, you know, with him, I don't know what to believe. Okay. So he's with, with the shooting dogs and, you say sheep and llamas or something. Recreational violence or something to go at, like beating up people. Yeah, that, that's, what I was, that's what I was looking for. Recreational violence. Is that, is that what you called it? R RVing, I guess. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Samuel was so easy to give up because he wanted all of this to be over. He admitted to killing Claudia Gutierrez. He said it was his first kill and did it because he was scared Dale would kill him if he didn't do it. When they got back to their apartments that night, Dale told him, Oh, dude. You got the first murder of the year in Scottsdale. I'm jealous. He also mentions that Dale admitted to killing Nathaniel Schaffner after he called Dale, and I quote, a Bill Clinton looking motherfucker. The two would get high on crystal meth before going out and killing others, which explains why the two were up so late committing these crimes. Jeff introduced Samuel to Dale and eventually became roommates in the spring of 2006. Before the duo began their killings, they were making money by shoplifting just about anything and selling them for quick cash. This was during the four month break period before the killings continued. Samuel didn't want to deal with the trial and pleaded guilty to the two murders of Claudia Gutierrez and Robin Blasnek and agreed to testify against Dale. However, Dale pleaded not guilty to the 88 charges including eight murders. These are the two monsters we've been hunting. Two years ago, he was named one of the two men who had the Phoenix area on edge for months. Dale Hosner is accused of leading the notorious serial shooter attacks. Police say he fatally shot eight people and attacked 20 others between 2005 and 2006. Two doors from my apartment. I come out this morning and there's hundreds of cops everywhere. Police say they identified Dale Hausner and Samuel Dietman as suspects in the serial shootings case on Monday. There were no similarities amongst the victims. The best we can tell, they were just random victims. And these, these individuals just picked folks out and 
that, that was it. And now at the opening of his murder trial, prosecutors are calling him a narcissist. They say he kept newspaper clippings of the shootings and enjoyed the effect on city residents. The 35-year-old pleaded not guilty to the 87 criminal counts he's charged with. I'm just guilty by association, even though I did not shoot anybody or kill anybody. It's the first day of what's expected to be a nine-month trial. Osner and his roommate, Samuel Dietman, were arrested in August of 2006 in their apartment. Dietman has already pleaded guilty to two murders in the case. Brian Thomas, The Associated Press. Of course, residents of Phoenix would be relieved to hear the news of the serial shooting suspects being brought to justice. But Dell's brother, Randy, was surprised to hear about his brother being the suspect. The night Dell got arrested, Randy's mother showed up to his house to tell him the news. They were both shaking from the thought that Dale was the killer all along. Randy rushed to the nearest police department to get confirmation from someone. As he's inside looking for someone to speak to, he sees his brother in cuffs on TV and people inside the police department were cheering. Randy was in disbelief. Dale would have a press conference on August 7, 2006, where he would claim that he was guilty by association and that he had never shot anyone. He still kept pointing the blame towards Sam as a trigger man. He says, he was using my car without my knowledge. When asked why he had so many weapons, he says, I am a gun collector and I have a lot of weapons, as do most Americans. He said he was a disorganized person and would leave his car keys anywhere, which meant Sam had easy access to his vehicle and weapons. He denied setting both Walmarts on fire and when asked about all the newspaper clippings he had, he just responded with, it is kind of interesting what's going on in Phoenix. Eventually, he got up and said this press conference is over. Randy eventually got in contact with Dell, and he insisted that he was innocent, that they got the wrong guy and that it was all Sam's fault. He's the one who took his car and shot people to make it look like it was him. Randy believed his brother was innocent. The reason he took his side is not only is he family, but growing up, Randy said that Dale was the kind of guy to admit his wrongdoings. Whenever Randy caught him doing something wrong, such as doing drugs, Dale would always own up to it. Randy said he'll believe him until proven otherwise. After all, it's innocent until proven guilty. Unfortunately for Randy and the rest of the Hausner family, they were constantly getting harassed and vandalized by people in their community. Randy's house and car were vandalized and had to stay over at a friend's house for a few weeks because he didn't feel safe anymore. Jeff Hausner was arrested in late October of 2006. His arrest took a while because police were having a hard time locating the stabbing victim, Timothy, and they needed him to develop probable cause. Once found, he was able to identify Jeff as the person who stabbed them. He also identified Sam as the other man who was with them. Jeff claimed he was innocent, that he had nothing to do with the stabbings or the shooting, stating, neither did Dale, were both innocent. However, Timothy's story was consistent with Samuel's testimony, which helped convict Jeff for the stabbing. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison for two stabbings, one of them being unrelated to the matter. He's currently serving his sentence at the Arizona State Prison in Buckeye, Arizona. He's only a few years away from being released at the time of making this video. Samuel Dietman was convicted of two murders and conspiracy to commit murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in April 2008. Because he agreed to testify against Del Hausner, prosecutors dropped 50 criminal charges including arson, attempted murder, and avoided the death penalty. He's currently serving his sentence at the Arizona State Prison in Graham County. A few months later, Dale's trial started in September of 2008, and his family was there to support him as Dale continued proclaiming his innocence. However, that same day, Randy would find something shocking. As he cleaned the storeroom that Dale had, he discovered a red notebook that was a diary that belonged to Dale. In it, Dale wrote in gruesome details how he loved killing animals, such as skinning them alive and throwing them out in the sun to die a slow and painful death getting in a vehicle and hitting people in the head with a bat as he drives past them, having a passion of breaking things when he was nine, and saying he made someone ill by putting rat poison in their milk. Here's an example of the many things he said. This is a direct quote from his notebook. The birds that I shot and didn't immediately die were tortured. 
Others were buried up to their necks in the yard. Sometimes I would put them in a shoebox and microwave them. The smell was horrible, but I enjoyed the end result. After reading this and remembering how his brother swore up and down to his face that he was innocent, it made him sick and he described Dale as a true psychopath. He was able to stand by Dale believing he was innocent, but this diary was damning evidence for Randy to believe his brother was a serial killer. This did answer some questions he had from early December of 2005 when he noticed Dale frequently missed work. The two worked together at an airport in Phoenix as a janitor, and when Dale started missing work, Randy suspected he was back on drugs. Dale denied and said he was missing work because he was severely depressed, and Randy believed him. While in jail, Dale attempted suicide and failed. Randy would visit him again and confront him about the diary that he found. He told Dale that he was tired of hearing him pleading innocent, calling him sick and that he really messed up. From there, Dale just accepts it. He doesn't admit to the killings, but he doesn't deny it either. On March 13, 2009, Dale would be found guilty on 80 out of the 88 charges, including first degree murder, attempted murder, animal cruelty, arson, and much more. David Estrada's mother and Paul Patrick were both present in the courtroom and were shocked when Dale flipped them off and listened to the recordings when both the suspects bragged about their killings. Dale denied he ever made any obscene gestures towards Paul and David's mother. Dale still insisted that he was innocent, and while on the witness stand, he compared himself to Charles Manson saying, when you think of Manson 50 years from now, you'll think of Hausner. Dale had several arguments in court like the wiretaps were illegal because no emergency situation could have satisfied the statutory requirements. Another was that there was no way he shot those people or animals because he would never harm anything and he's not a violent person. In the end, he was sentenced to die six times by lethal injection. He wasn't surprised, he accepted it, but still never admitted guilt. After being found guilty, he apologized to the victim, stating, I'm willing to accept the punishment, and I firmly believe, to help the victims heal, that it should be the death penalty. Could you please tell me your full name, Mr. Hausner? Dale Sean Hausner. Your date of birth? February 4th, 1973. The jury having returned verdicts on counts 5, 15, 20, 22, 37, and 86, finding you guilty of first degree murder. It is the judgment of the court that you're guilty of first degree murder in count 5, count 15, count 20, count 22, count 37, and count 86 in violation of ARS 131101, 131105, 13301, 13302, 13303, 13304, 13703, 13702, 137202, and 801. It is the judgment of the court as to count 15 that you be sentenced to death. It is the judgment of the court as to count 15 that you be sentenced to death. It is the judgment of the court as to count 20 that you be sentenced to death. It is the judgment of the court as to count 22 that you be sentenced to death. And as to count 37, it is the judgment of the court that you be sentenced to death. And count 86. This is the judgment of the court that should be sentenced to death. The court will resolve the restitution hearings on Monday. The non-capital sentencing will be Monday at 10.30 in this division. And we will resolve all non-capital sentencing issues and restitution at that point in time. And your appellate rights will be read to you on these counts. You'll have an automatic right of appeal and those will be given to you on Monday. And I'll end the proceedings today. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, my clerk tells me that I apparently said to count 15 twice. So as to count five, it is the judgment of the court that you be sentenced to death. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Annie, do you want to take the jury back? And um, members of the jury, you are now discharged from your admonition. 
Obviously, I will have continuing duties in this matter. I will thank you, but I will not discuss the facts of the case with you. Um, when I finish the lawyer's name. Although Dell was convicted of killing six, he was suspected of killing two others in May back in 2005, right before the murder of David Estrada. The two victims were Tony Mendez and Reginald Remlard. Both victims were killed at night similar to the other victims, but Dale was acquitted of those charges. Into the newsroom tonight, we're hearing from the brother of Dale Hausner, one of the Valley's serial shooters who was just found dead in his prison cell. Randy Hausner says, quote, this ends the life of a person who chose to do horrible things to innocent people. We as a family stand with the victims of the crimes and their families. Today, a murderer died and is going on to face the ultimate judge. ABC 15's Brian Webb is joining us now going in-depth on Hausner and the crimes. Dale committed suicide by overdosing on antidepressants that he stacked up over time. In October 2012, he wrote a letter to a judge that he didn't want to appear in court as it was too stressful for him so he requested to be executed immediately. The following month, a judge ordered a psychological evaluation, but this isn't what got him antidepressants. The medication was given to him by another inmate. The inmate remained anonymous, but said that Dale briefly mentioned to him that he had trouble sleeping. This inmate had several sleeping pills given to him by the prison nurse. The nurse wouldn't check to make sure he swallowed the pills, so he managed to save up a few that he didn't feel like taking. For two months, he kept giving Dale four to five pills a week by fishing them to him. The inmate recalled Dale mentioning committing suicide with the pills, but the inmate kept giving them to him as he thought Dale was taking the pills as soon as he received them. To add to Randy's statement, he said as sad as it sounds, there was a bit of relief that he felt when he heard his brother died. Surprised, but relief that it felt like it was all over. People have told him that he was hard on his brother, but no matter how much he loved them and how close they grew up together, wrong is wrong and Dale had to face the music. Hausner did manage to write a letter to a Republic reporter. It reads, They say serial killers do not have real remorse for their crimes, only remorse they got caught. Where do you stand on this? Very, very few have remorse for their crimes or their actions. Psychopaths don't feel sympathy for their victims. Most of which they could have killed more. On Arizona death row, I have spoken to six to eight serial killers. None regret their crimes, not even the baby killers. The thing that made them a serial killer also stops them from having remorse. I have tried to repent for my sins as best as I can. I ask for forgiveness and that the Lord can change my heart. The Bible states that if you believe in Jesus and call to him, you will be saved. So I think I will make it to heaven, even though I don't deserve it. I can't imagine why they would want me. But Saul, who was renamed Paul, was a murderer and he was forgiven. So that gives me hope. Many people believe that Dale was born to kill, but others think certain events in his life slowly turned him into a killer. Randy's first memory of Dale's sadistic tendencies was when Dale stood up to a bully in elementary school. He was practicing hitting the punching bag when one day during school, his bully approached him and he punched his bully giving him a nosebleed. Randy was proud of Dale for standing up for himself. However, Dale made a comment that worried him. Dale said he enjoyed the sight of his bully's blood on his hands. As he got older, Dale spent time boxing with Randy and eventually became a sports journalist. He even managed to meet Mike Tyson. But his behavior worsened after an event that took place on the night of November 12, 1994, when his two sons, Donovan and Jeremiah, aged 3 and 2, died by drowning in a creek after a car accident. Dale's wife at the time was driving, and she and Dale managed to swim up to safety. Dale even mentioned during his trial that he died the day his kids drowned. Not long after, he and his wife divorced. According to Randy, it mentally messed with Dale and began using drugs to cope and his behavior continued to get worse. After Dale's death, Randy wanted to meet some of the surviving victims and the victim's relatives. In an episode of Monsters in My Family, Randy would meet surviving victim Clarissa Rowley and Tony Menace's son, 
Justin. Both didn't hold any grudges towards Randy as they were able to see the genuine pain in his eyes as he apologized for his brother's actions. Out of the two, Justin was the most surprised. He thought Randy would be just as cruel as Dell. It's tough to watch as Dell didn't just ruin other families, he ruined his own and Randy holds guilt over his brother's sick actions as if it was his fault. That was until many other of Dell's victims and their relatives told him that they understood his pain. They also had close loved ones that have done horrible things and know exactly the type of pain he feels. Now before I end the video, there's one piece of information I left out. During Dell's killing spree, there was another serial killer police and residents of Phoenix had to worry about. When Dell decided to continue killing after taking a four month break, it was because his ego was hurt seeing the other serial killer take his spotlight, or as he called it, his thunder. Yeah. Uh, we gotta go, we gotta find him. <laughs>